Yet another view is that Jesus was placed on the cross, but before he died from his injuries or before they killed him, God intervened directly and caused them to die, then returned his soul to him sometime later. Dr. Ali Atay refers to this as the divine rapture theory. Still yet, others have interpreted this verse as a refutation to the Talmud's claim that Jesus was first stoned and then hung. So, as we see, there are different ways to understand 4157 without denying that Jesus was crucified and or died. Greetings, good evening everyone, and welcome back to Blogging Tawheed. Jesus of Nazareth, the Messiah, son of Mary, represents the common link between both Christianity and Islam, having the most followers on earth. However, what happened to Jesus of Nazareth at the end of his earthly life some 2,000 years ago is a point of dispute between Christians and Muslims. The Christian Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, tell the story about the death of Jesus at the hands of the Romans by crucifixion. Yet the Quran disputes these accounts. My guest and I hope that today's conversation and future conversations as well, inshallah, God, God willing, will help all of us understand the significance of Jesus and the importance of his message. Having said that, it's my pleasure to introduce my guest, Brother Al on Blogging Tawheed. You're most welcome, bro Brother Al. Thank you. Thank you. Brother Al joins us from California, where he studied Christian and Biblical Studies at Biola University, which is a non-denominational evangelical Christian university in La Miranda, California. The topic for today's conversation is the crucifixion. I will be challenging Brother Al on what is considered to be the historical fact, namely that Jesus of Nazareth, the Messiah, son of Mary, was crucified to death by the Roman Imperium. Brother Al and I have agreed on the format of today's conversation, and it should be as follows. 15-minute presentation each, 10 minutes rebuttal each, 10 minutes to question the other person each, and five minutes wrap up our conversa our presentation each. Brother Al, is there anything you would like to add before you start your presentation? No, everything sounds good. All right, then the floor and the mic are yours. I'm going to mute myself. All right. Well, first off, I'd like to give glory to the triune God of the Bible, namely the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I would also like to thank Aziz for taking the time to discuss this very important topic. My hope is that after this discussion, he as well as other Muslims may come to the realization that they can affirm the crucifixion of Jesus without that belief violating any Quranic teaching. It should be noted that for the most part, only Muslims deny that Jesus was crucified. So why is that? Virtually all scholars of early Christianity or related fields conclude that Jesus was put on a cross on orders of the Roman governor. Craig Blomberg and N.T. Wright have rightly stated, quote, no serious historian of any religious or non-religious stripe doubt that Jesus of Nazareth really lived in the first century and was executed under the authority of Pontius Pilate, the governor of Judea and Samaria, unquote. These scholars base their conclusions largely on literary evidence, but this literary evidence is also corroborated by archeological evidence, such as the bloodstone amulet. Now, whether or not you like the New Testament, the New Testament writings are considered historical documents. I think that's important. All four canonical gospels record a detailed narrative of Jesus's passion. All four gospels are absolutely clear that Jesus, not somebody else, but Jesus, was nailed to the cross. All four Gospels tell us that, that Jesus' female followers were eyewitnesses to his crucifixion on the cross. And according to one of these four Gospels, Mary, the mother of Jesus, was an eyewitness to the crucifixion. In fact, 
her presence at the event is attested to in numerous Muslim sources. Now, typically, my Muslim friends will deny what the Gospels say about the crucifixion for two main reasons. One of them is that the Gospel authors were not eyewitnesses to the crucifixion. The other reason is that the Gospel accounts contain variations in wording as well as additions and omissions of certain details. But in regard to the Gospels not being written by eyewitnesses, Justin Bass rightly notes on page 27 in The Bedrock of Christianity that in most cases, the historical events we read about are written by individuals many generations later. Likewise, Oxford historian A.N. Sherman White on page 186 of Roman Law and Roman Society says historians of ancient history are usually, quote, dealing with derivative sources of marked bias and prejudice composed at least one or two generations after the events they describe, but much more often, as with the lives of Plutarch or central decades of Levi, from two to five centuries later, unquote. So according to scholars, most ancient history is written generations, even hundreds of years after the fact. For this reason, I am in agreement with them that eyewitness testimony is not necessary for an account to be considered historically reliable. In fact, if we demanded eyewitness testimony to substantiate every event in antiquity, we would have to throw out most of ancient history. Now, as for the Gospels containing variations in wording between parallel accounts, it should be remembered that the omission or addition of details from an account does not constitute as a contradiction. The Quran also contains variations in wording between stories which recount the same event. For example, read Surah 780 and then compare it with Surah 2754. Notice, these two accounts retell the same story, yet they contain differences in detail and differences in wording, just like the Gospels do. Yet, no Muslims would chalk this up to a contradiction. So, we need to be consistent in what we see as problematic. In addition to the New Testament, the crucifixion of Jesus is also attested to in the writings of Josephus and Tacitus. These are non-Christian Jewish and Roman historians, respectively. In a writing called the Testimonium Flavianum, Josephus writes, quote, When Pilate, upon hearing him accused by men of the highest standing among us, had condemned him to be crucified, those who had in the first place come to love him did not give up their affection for him, unquote. This particular phrase is not one of three disputed clauses, and it is written in Josephine language. So with that in mind, there is no good reason to reject it. In regard to Tacitus, he writes, quote, Christus, the founder of the name, had undergone the death penalty in the reign of Tiberius by sentence of the procurator Pontius Pilate, unquote. These two sources corroborate with the New Testament. Now, the most typical response to using Josephus and Tacitus is that these two men are just repeating Christian hearsay. But this notion is challenged by the fact that Josephus was a native to Jerusalem and lived contemporaneously with the original apostles. So, if one believes that Josephus was repeating something he heard from others, the burden of proof is on them to first prove that Josephus didn't come into contact with the original apostles or that he didn't question those who attended the crucifixion themselves. As for Tacitus, Paul, Eddie, and Gregory Boyd point out on page 182 in the Jesus legend that it is improbable he would rely on hearsay of a group he himself identifies as evil. Furthermore, Tacitus habitually qualified anything he deemed questionable using phrases such as, it was said, or it was reported, in order to describe something he was told. And in one account, he outright says his goal was to put down hearsay. In the Annals 411, he says, quote, My object in mentioning and refuting this story is, by a conspicuous example, to put down hearsay, unquote. Now, in light of this information, I'm curious if my friend Aziz also believes that Josephus and Tacitus were just repeating the words of Christians. And if he does... I'd like to ask if he could please provide us with evidence proving these historians were just repeating Christian hearsay. I also believe the phrase, it was made to appear to them, 
is the source of much confusion between Christians and Muslims. It has been misrepresented by many of my Muslim friends to mean that Josephus and Tacitus and other writers throughout history mention that Jesus was crucified simply because this is what appeared to them. But I say that's improbable. Only those who were present at the event experienced a false appearance. This means that ancient writers who report that Jesus was crucified cannot be reporting this as a result of divine illusion because these writers weren't present at the event. Now, what does the Quran say about the crucifixion? I have heard many of my Muslim friends allege that the Quran says, Jesus never died, but that's also incorrect. The verse only asserts that the Jews did not crucify Jesus. This is obviously different than saying that Jesus was never crucified. In fact, there are multiple interpretations given to Surah 4, 157, which allow us to believe that Jesus was crucified. One view is that the phrase, they did not kill him, could be understood to mean that the martyrs should not be seen as dead, but rather alive. Surah 3, 169 says, Think not of those who are slain in Allah's way as dead. Nay, they live, finding their sustenance in the presence of their Lord. So this would suggest that though Jesus was killed, the concept of that being taught in Surah 3, 169 was being utilized in Surah 4, 157. Another view is that God is denying that Jesus was killed according to the will of his enemies. Rather, it was God who caused him to die even though sometimes he uses the agency of others to accomplish it. Surah 8.17 says, It is not Yeh who slew them, it was Allah. When thou threwest a handful of dust, it was not thy act, but Allah's, in order that he might test the believers by a gracious trial from himself, for Allah is he who heareth and knoweth all things. Yet another view is that Jesus was placed on the cross, but before he died from his injuries or before they killed him, God intervened directly and caused them to die, then returned his soul to him sometime later. Dr. Ali Ate refers to this as the divine rapture theory. Still yet, others have interpreted this verse as a refutation to the Talmud's claim that Jesus was first stoned and then hung. So, as we see, there are different ways to understand 4157 without denying that Jesus was crucified and or died. So, if the Quran does not unequivocally deny that Jesus was crucified, why do the majority of Muslims today believe that a lookalike substitute was crucified in Jesus' place? It is my personal belief that this notion, as popular as it may be, is most likely due to hearsay. It has more to do with tradition than it does with facts. One problem I see with the substitution theory is that it's misleading. We are told the verse is talking about a lookalike substitute but in all actuality, it doesn't mention any substitute. The other problem I see is with the substitution theory is that it's not, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> Another problem I see with the substitution theory is that it's not a teaching derived from exegesis. Popular Muslim apologist Adnan Rashid in his debate with Samuel Green has admitted that the substitution theory is, quote, not a Quranic position, unquote. Likewise, during a dialogue with Hatun Tash, Adnan Rashid said, quote, This theory is non-existent in the Quran, unquote. So, as we see, we have popular Muslim uh, figures admitting that the substitution theory is not something necessarily derived from the exegesis of 4157. For this reason, there are some conservative Sunnis today who affirm that Jesus was placed on the cross. For example, Etta Shemgulam is a Sunni apologist who recently debated David Wood on the crucifixion, and yet he believes Jesus was crucified. Likewise, Dr. Shabir Ali is another Sunni who holds this belief as well. Thus, Muslims can and do affirm the crucifixion of Jesus. With all of this in mind, I ask my friend to be open-minded and to seriously consider the validity of the information that's been provided. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Al, for this excellent presentation. I'm going to get my uh, time, but let me first, I'm going to mute you for a minute. Is that okay? Sounds good. Get my time going.
All right. I'm all set. To begin with, I would like to recite a verse from the Quran that deals with the crucifixion, as it is called in Arabic, Ayat al or the verse of crucifixion. This verse, however, is preceded by interesting events that lead to the supposed crucifixion. And to do justice to this verse, one must read or recite, in my case, a couple verses prior so that we understand the context, since it's all about the context. And you get a sense of what the author is trying to convey in terms of this particular verse. And obviously, reading it in Arabic language is not the same, since the translation of the meaning does not really convey the message from a linguistic perspective. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God the Almighty, gl glory be to him, says in the Quran, and I will be translating the meaning as I recite these verses. A'udhu billahi min shaitan rajim Yas'aluka ahlul kitabi an tunazzil alayhim kitaban min as-sama Faqad sa'alu Musa ak akbar min dhalik فَقَالُوا أَرِنَ اللَّهَ جَهْرَةً فَأَخَذَتْهُمُ الصَّاعِقَةُ بِظُلْمِهِمْ ثُمَّ اتَّخَذُوا الْعِجْلَ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا جَاءَتْهُمُ الْبَيْنَاتُ فَعَفَوْنَا عَنْ ذَلِكْ وَآتَيْنَا مُوسَى سُلْطَانًا مُبِينًا The people of the scripture ask you, O Muhammad, to physically bring down the book to them a book from the heaven but they have asked and demanded of moses even greater than that when they said show us god outright so the thunderbolt struck them for their wrongdoing then they took the calf as an object of worship after clear evidence had come to them and yet we pardoned them and gave moses clear authority wa rafa'na fawqahum at-tur bi mithaqihim wa qulna lahum udkhulu al-baba sujjada wa qulna lahum la ta'du fi as-sabt wa akhadna minhum mithaqan ghalida and we raised over them the mount for refusal of their covenant and we said to them enter the gate bowing humbly and do not transgress on the Sabbath. And we took a Solomon pledge or a covenant. And so we cursed them for breaking their covenant or the pledge for rejecting God's revelations and their disbelief in the signs of God for unjustly killing their prophets without right. And they're saying, our minds are closed. Rather, God has sealed them in their disbelief. So they believed not except a few. وَبِكُفْرِهِمْ وَقَوْلِهِمْ عَلَى مَرْيَمَ بُهْتَانًا عَظِيمًا And because they disbelieved and uttered a terrible slander against Mary. وَقَوْلِهِمْ إِنَّا قَتَلْنَا الْمَسِيحَ عِيسَ بْنَ مَرْيَمَ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ وَمَا قَتَلُوهُ وَمَا صَلَبُوهُ وَلَكِنْ شُبِّهَ لَهُمْ وَإِنَّ الَّذِينَ اخْتَلَفُوا فِيهِ لَفِي شَكٍ مِّنْهِ مَا لَهُمْ بِهِ مِنْ عِلْمٍ إِلَّا اتِّبَاعَ الظَّنِّ وَمَا قَتَلُوهُ يَقِينًا And for their saying, indeed, we have killed the Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary, the messenger of God. They did not kill him, nor did they crucify him, though it was made to appear like that to them. And those who disagreed about him are full of doubt. They have no knowledge of it except supposition or assumption. They did not kill him for certain. 
بل رفعه الله إليه وكان الله عزيزا حكيما صدق الله العظيم Rather God raised him up to himself and ever is God the exalted in might and wise. So my dear brother, this is the Quranic position. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Almighty, the creator of all souls, says they did not kill him, nor did they crucify him. It was made to appear to them, and those who disagreed about him are full of doubts. Muslims, pretty much, as you know, always quote this verse whenever the crucifixion topic is raised. So who are we to argue against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Almighty, who says they did not kill him, nor did they crucify him? We don't. We believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Almighty, and we trust the divine revelation he sent up in his Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam, and the previous revelations in their original forms. So as far as a Muslim is concerned, Jesus was not crucified, nor did he die on the cross. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows of the events that took place. How, when, and what happened is really not that important. And I think this is the best Muslim position regarding what happened at the crucifixion. My Christian brothers and sisters, however, not all Christians, find it quite shocking and surprising when they first come across this verse, and that is the Quran's clear denial of the crucifixion of Jesus, which is found only in one verse in the entire Quran. And in many people's eyes, especially in the West, this verse discredits the Quran. How can we take this alleged revelation seriously? which denies the historical evidence when we have the four Gospels written by eyewitnesses, which clearly testifies to Jesus was crucified. We have the Apostle Paul, a disciple of Jesus, who clearly states that Jesus was crucified. So the Quran surely must be an error when it denies that Jesus was crucified. This is the kind of, you know, reaction we get from our Christian brothers and sisters. Now, I would like to take a couple minutes and focus briefly on something that is something that is often overlooked whenever the topic of the crucifixion is raised before I come back to the verses I recited. So while the doctrine of the crucifixion and redemption is central to Christianity, the Islamic worldview has no problem with a martyred prophet and miraculous resurrection. We actually don't have an, any issue with a prophet who gets tortured, crucified, and martyred by the very same people he was sent to. After all, John the Baptist, a mighty messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, was martyred by his own people. And in the parable of the hamlet in ruins, the Quran mentions the uh, resurrection of a man after a hundred years, which is mentioned in chapter 2, verse 259. That is again one of the most striking parables in the Quran that touches upon the essential theological and existential questions that man in every place and time necessarily reflects upon. After all, and according to uh, Al Bayhaqi in Dala'il al Nubuwa, he says, Whoever lives, dies. Whoever dies, perishes. And whatever is bound to happen will happen. Everything is mortal. Immortality lies only with the Almighty, who is one without partners, without alike. There is a, many a passage to enter the river of death, but alas, no way out. Having said that, affirming or denying the historical event of the crucifixion has little bearing on Islam. The, the more substantial contention that Muslims have is with the idea of atonement. Muslims believe that they, we, they, they will bear consequences of their own sins unless forgiven by God the Almighty, the most compassionate or forgiven. The sins of Adam is not inherited by those who did not commit it. Presumably, those between Adam and John, the Baptist, were simply expected to worship God the Almighty and live an ethical life. Muslims see no need for this to change with the Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary. So the idea of a human sacrifice 
absolving the past and future sins of humanity is simply contrary to what the Quran teaches and what Jesus, Moses, Abraham, and the previous prophets' teachings. Putting an innocent man to a brutal death on the cross rather than simply forgiving mankind out of divine grace goes against the sensibilities of Muslims. This concept is so dangerous, it creates enmity between humanity, and forgiveness becomes conditioned by the so-called sacrifice. If God demands blood sacrifice to forgive, humans would require the same. Why would I forgive you, my brother, out of my goodness, if God himself could not forgive out of his mercy? You see? Now, back to the crucifixion verse, which you already spoke about it as well, which has largely been understood by both Muslims and in some ways, more interestingly, by Christians as a denial of the historical and to many irrefutable facts of the crucifixion of Jesus. And obviously, such a doctrinal position serves as a great obstacle separating us, Muslims and Christians, on the grounds of belief. The interpretation of this verse has been the subject of vigorous debates between Christians and Muslims for centuries, partly because many Muslim commentators offer different theories concerning this verse. Yet, all agree that Jesus did not die on the cross. And I know you mentioned a couple things that uh, some Muslims like the Ahmadiyya, we don't subscribe to the Ahmadiyya. Ahmadiyya, actually, they are outside of the fold of Islam. Anyhow, some of these theories come from Christian apocryphal sources in the second century, which is ironically speak loudly of the substitute theory before the advent of Islam. Now, the vast majority of the followers of Islam do hold that Jesus, in fact, was not crucified, but remains alive with God in a spiritual realm from where he will descend at the end of time in an Islamic version of the second coming. There are always other ways of interpreting this verse that historically have been offered as possible readings. My opinion is, as a linguist, the Arabic text reads, وَمَا قَتَلُوهُ وَمَا صَلَبُوهُ وَلَكِنْ شُبِّهَ لَهُمْ So, they did not kill him, nor did they crucify him, but it appeared to them. The key here is not the qatl, is not the killing. Or the soul of the crucifixion but the verb shubbiha that comes from tashbih allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not say wama qataluhu, wama salabuhu, walakin lahum. so in linguistics shabbaha yushabbihu tashbihan fahuwa mushabbih wal maf'ul mushabbah or the object uh, pronoun so shubbiha lahum means lubbisa ikhtalata alayhim and Adam Tamiz, meaning, I will explain in English language, meaning they were confused about him and they argued amongst themselves. They were not sure if that was Jesus or not. And this is actually what comes after God says they did not kill him, nor did they crucify him, but it was made to appear to them. Then God says, And those who disagreed about him are full of doubt. Now, why did they argue and disagree about who was crucified? And this is the reason I lean towards this theory of substitution or look like Jesus. Historically, Judas, uh, I only got a couple minutes, so I'm almost done with my presentation. Historically, Judas betrayed Jesus and he was leading the Romans to Jesus. But somehow, Judah at some point was transformed by God the Almighty into the appearance of Jesus who the authorities subsequently crucified. This is also confirmed by the lost gospel that Judah was weeping hysterically, knowing he was going to be crucified. And he kept telling the Roman soldiers, I am Judah, I am not Jesus. And they kept saying, okay, whatever. So the behaviors of Judah made them suspect something fishy, something does not add up. Jesus did not cry except when praying. Now, Jesus, the alleged God, or Son of God, is weeping hysterically. That's why the Qur'an says, وَإِنَّ الَّذِينَ اخْتَلَفُوا فِيهِ لَفِي شَكٍ مِنْهِ And those who disagreed about him are full of doubt. They doubted if the person on the cross was Jesus. 
Also, the body of Judah is then stolen from the grave, leading to claims that he, who everyone allegedly thought was Jesus, rose from the dead, resurrected, and ascended to heaven. And something here, uh, to close my, uh, my statement, something here for interesting for anyone who wants to dig deeper into Judah personality is that according to historians, Judah looked a lot like Jesus. Even Leonardo da Vinci's Last Supper mural painting, which took years to be completed, he admits to having struggled to make a distinction between Jesus and Judah because historically they looked alike. The other theory is of a disciple of Jesus. Jesus asked his disciples at the Last Supper who would take his place on the cross and be rewarded paradise, meaning the likeness of Jesus would be put on one of Jesus' disciples. And one of them, uh, some say the, young, the youngest one, said, I am O messenger of God. This concludes my presentation. I'm going to go ahead and mute myself and unmute you, and you go ahead with your um, rebuttal. All right. Well, one of the things that was mentioned was that in the Islamic worldview, that there is no problem with the idea of a prophet being uh, crucified or martyred. And I agree. The Quran admits that many prophets were murdered. Uh, for example, Tal Lawson rightly says, quote, a distinctive characteristic of Quranic prophethood is the unremitting opposition that greets those upon whom it is bestowed. That this opposition frequently ends in the murder of a prophet is well known, e.g. Surah 261, 287, 291, 321, 3183, and 4155, unquote. So I agree, there would be nothing strange with the notion that Jesus died unjustly at the hands of the Jews like so many prophets before him did. One of the things you also alluded to is that this could be believed if Muslims disassociate the salvific nature of the cross. So I think that if Muslims can come to that understanding, dialogues between Muslims and Christians can go a lot further. Another thing that was mentioned was that 4157 is a denial of the crucifixion. But as I pointed out in my opening statement, I don't, I don't agree and I don't believe that the verse is denying that Jesus was crucified. I believe that contextually speaking, the plural pronoun they is referring to a particular group and that the verse is saying this particular group did not do this and that. But this doesn't mean that Jesus was not crucified full stop. And as I pointed out in my opening statement, there are Sunni Muslim scholars who have put forth some interpretations of 4157, which allow you to interpret that verse, having the, coming to the conclusion that Jesus was crucified and or killed. Uh, for example, I mentioned that Dr. Ali Ate, uh quotes to or how to this divine rapture theory, where he says 4157 could be uh, understood as Allah taking Jesus' soul, causing him to die so that the enemies don't get credit and then a few days later returning the soul to jesus therefore reviving him back uh it was also said that some early christians believed that jesus was not crucified however the people that you're referring to hold to a docetic view and they denied that jesus had a real physical body but denying that jesus had a human nature is actually a denial of one of the core christological beliefs so Referring to the docetist as Christians would be similar to referring to uh, polytheists as Muslims. No one in the right mind would say that someone who believes in many gods could be considered a Muslim. Likewise, I would say that no one who denies that Jesus had a human nature could be considered a, a Christian. You also made mention about the Old Testament, and you did say that some of the prophets in the Old Testament or the prophets that came before Jesus uh, didn't hold to this blood sacrifice. However, I would point out to you that if you read the Old Testament, all the prophets in the Old Testament did mention that God required a sacrifice. And if you read Leviticus 16, there was a day, one special day between the year where the two goats were sacrificed, and this was to make atonement for all the Israelites, for all the people. So we see that although it's not a one-to-one -one racial parallel, it is a type and shadow which pointed to Jesus' coming and his ultimate sacrifice, which he gave for us 
And yes, as a Christian, I do believe I do believe that the death of Jesus on the cross carries a salvific uh, significance with it. But for this, for the purpose of this debate, I am hoping that my Muslim friends will see that one can come, one can uh, read the Quran and come to the conclusion that he was crucified without that belief being compromised or without having for you to feel like you are compromising a Quranic uh, teaching. You also mentioned that Ahmadiyyas do believe Jesus was crucified, but that you don't consider them uh, true Muslims. However, I actually mentioned not the Ahmadiyyas, but I mentioned conservative Sunni scholars, uh, namely Dr. Shabrali and Dr. Ali Ate. And both of these Sunni scholars do hold to the belief that Jesus was put on the cross. I know Dr. Ali holds to the spoon theory, and I think the spoon theory has its own major problems with it. But I'm pointing them out to show that even conservative Sunni scholars who do believe in what the Quran says do interpret Surah 4, 157, and they come away with the conclusion that you could read it and believe that Jesus was crucified and that there is no problem or no conflation with that as far as other beliefs are concerned. So far, those are all the points that you mentioned during your uh, opening statement. I'm pretty sure in your rebuttal period, you can uh, hopefully mention some things I said about possibly Josephus, possibly uh, Tacitus. I think that, to reiterate, these two historians are often thrown under the bus, often ignored. They're often said they're just repeating hearsay. However, if it's not the case that Josephus and Tacitus are repeating hearsay, and if it's not the case that what they write about Jesus on the cross is not the result of a divine illusion, then you have multiple attestations, or specifically these two sources, added to the New Testament, corroborating with the New Testament. So in addition to the New Testament, you would have the writings of Josephus, the writings of Tacitus. I didn't bring up Lucian in my opening statement, but there is evidence to show that he too mentioned Jesus was crucified, and that what he writes is coming from an independent tradition, not from Christian hearsay. And so once you take these sources, we recognize that, well, I believe personally that I can believe Jesus was crucified because his death is multiply attested in sources. I also believe he was crucified because certain passages in the New Testament which speak about the crucifixion also meet the criterion of embarrassment. For example, in Mark 8, Jesus mentions and foretells his disciples of his uh, upcoming death. However, Peter says, no, Lord, far be that from you. And then Jesus ends up rebuking Peter and calling him Satan. This would have been seen as something embarrassing to the early church. So there are passages throughout the New Testament pertaining to the crucifixion that meet the criterion of embarrassment. And lastly, I also believe that the crucifixion of Jesus could be affirmed due to the fact that it's the argument for best explanation. The explanatory scope of the crucifixion is well attested. I think it's the best explanation, given the data that we have, that offers the least amount of uh, troubleshooting, the least amount of jumping through hoops, trying to make sense of the other data that we have. And so <clears throat> I, I addressed everything so far that you mentioned. And, uh, I know I have time left, but I'm going to defer my time right now, my friend. And I look forward to what you have to say and to speaking with you in the cross-examination. Thank you. All right. Let me set up my time. All right. Let me handle the salvation issue first since you started with it. Um. There are three things that may be said with certainty when it comes to the Quranic teachings. The Quran attaches no salvific importance to Jesus' supposed death. In other words, how Jesus died or not, and the fact that he died or will die has no significance for salvation for Muslims or anyone else is irrelevant. So it doesn't really matter how he died according to the Gospels. Salvation is not dependent on his death in any way at all. And I know that you mentioned uh, salvation through the Old Testament, and I will respond to that later in the questioning. 
So similarly, we see this reflected in the earliest Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, where people have received forgiveness and salvation from God based on the grace and mercy of God, and also their own repentance, and nothing to do with anyone dying on a cross. The Quran, firstly, attaches no significant importance to his death. Secondly, it doesn't mention his resurrection on the third day and has no need of it as a proof of God's power to raise the dead. And third, although the Jews thought that they had killed Jesus, from God's viewpoint, they did not kill him or crucify him. Beyond this is the realm of speculation. The verse I recited earlier indeed contains an ambiguous denial of Jesus' death by crucifixion. I know you mentioned uh, Dr. Shabir, Ali Shabir, and uh, Dr. Ali Atai. I, I don't think you listen to these people closely. What Dr. Ali Atai um, speak about is the theories that the Muslims have debated for years, for centuries. But they all agree and I said, as I said earlier, that this verse could be translated in many forms, but they all agree that Jesus did not die on the cross. So when we come to the Gospels and Paul's letters, biblical scholarship today have come to the overwhelming uh, consensus that they're not written by eyewitnesses. And I'll tell you later why eyewitnesses are very important, because you mentioned Josephus. And I'll, like I said, I'll leave it to the questioning. So Matthew's gospel, which is traditionally thought to be by the apostle Matthew, a disciple of Jesus called Matthew is not. It is anonymous. If you look at your Bible and you read, I have many. If you read the gospel, it doesn't say who the author is. And it doesn't read like an eyewitness testimony. An eyewitness would typically speak in the first person occasionally. He never does. He never says, I met Jesus, or we witnessed the crucifixion. It's always the, he, third person. Mark doesn't claim to be eyewitness either, and Luke is not an eyewitness. He's a companion of Paul and John. Again, who is this John? Because the crucifixion mainly is mentioned in John, right? The conclusion is even by conservative scholars that the Apostle John is not the John that is intended to be the author of that gospel. When we come to Paul, well, Paul never knew Jesus. He never met Jesus in his lifetime. He had a vision on the road to Damascus. A vision that in one account, the people with him did not see. So he had an invisible vision that only he saw. My brother, if you want to take that as a solid religious foundation for Christianity, so be it. But it's not a great basis. What my Christian brothers and sisters are not aware of is that Paul was an enemy of Jesus. This Jewish persona violently opposed Jesus' teachings, yet the Christians made him a saint. So what I'm trying to say is, we don't actually have an eyewitness testimony in the New Testament and even in Mark's gospel. The earliest gospel we have said that all the disciples, um, the apostles, scarpered, run away, and the women viewed the crucifixion from a distance. So they saw something that was a long way off that they thought was the crucifixion of Jesus, and that ties in actually to what the Quran said. It appeared to them that he had been uh, crucified, although he was not crucified. In fact, it's impossible. The Qur'an's claim, if you take the majority position, that he was not crucified is impossible to refute, because if it was made to appear to them, the Jews, that he was crucified, how could anyone deny that he was crucified? Because history reports it appeared to them that he was crucified. So, of course, history, of course, reports that he was crucified. So, ultimately, it comes down to who you trust. What is the four Gospels if they are not the words of Jesus or his disciples? What is the Quran 
if the Quran is the actual speech of God, the revelation of God, the Almighty Himself, then it has some inside knowledge. It knows what really what's really going on. He can say it appeared to people, but in fact, the contrary was the case. He can say it with authority. We can say that absolutely without any contradiction, because it's from God the Almighty. And if this claim is written by a 7th century Arab dude from Arabia, then, of course, you can dismiss it as an opinion uttered centuries after the 1st century by someone who couldn't possibly know what really happened and indeed had no reason to doubt the Christian claim. So at the end of the day, one cannot empirically prove the Quran wrong um, it comes down to a matter of faith. If you believe the Quran is the word of God, it claims to be the word of God, it's up to you to decide if it is, then you accept what it says is impossible to disprove because history cannot disprove historical research, cannot disprove the statement that it appeared to them, to people in the first century, that Jesus was crucified, though he was not. Now, how would you investigate that? You only have four Gospels and Paul's letters, and they're not even by eyewitnesses or his testimony in a way. And I would go further and say, from a theological perspective, while the Gospels remain the Christian's only resource uh, for information about the resurrection, crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus, the question is, are they the kind of sources historians would want when trying to establish what probably happened in the past at the cross in Jerusalem? I think the answer to that question is no. When were the Gospels written? Well, one thing for sure, they are not contemporary to the events they narrate. Scholars still debate when the Gospels were written, but by far the most common dating are that Mark was written sometime around 70 AD, Luke and Matthew about 10 or 15 years later, around 80 or 85 uh, AD, uh, John maybe around the year 90 or 95. These are the dates that are taught throughout the universities and divinity schools and seminaries all over the world. And I do think them to be close or about right for many reasons. And I think you did study uh, biblical studies, and you would agree with me that this, uh, this gospel's dates are almost correct. So as you can see, it is a complicated argument if these dates are correct. It means that the earliest account of Jesus' resurrection, uh, res uh, crucifixion or resurrection is 40 years after the event. 40 years is not an eyewitness. Now, Paul, on the other hand, was writing um, uh, before that. Paul talks about the um, crucifixion and resurrection in 1 Corinthians. Well, that's still 30 years after the event. It's earlier than the Gospels, supposedly, yet 20 or 30 years after the time of Jesus. Paul then is not an eyewitness. So the narratives Paul makes reference to is still a 20 30 year gap you don't have somebody who is right there writing about it an eyewitness because in the court of law an eyewitness or two or three is required as evidence for judgment and conviction it would be laughable if you tell the judge according to paul according to matthew according to mark according to luke and according to john these figures are anonymous according to the bible itself so telling the judge in the court of law that according to Anonymous, the Romans crucified Jesus will get you thrown out of the court. And another point that I would, uh, I would make, and I always make this point, I challenge all biblical scholars all over the world to prove these authors were eyewitnesses. Paul himself indicates that he was not an eyewitness. And none of these gospel writers was an eyewitness. People, of course, call them the gospel books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, because we don't know who wrote these books. I mean, they're written by people. We don't know who they were. And by thee, we mean anonymous. You might not think so just because 
they have the title the gospel according to matthew uh whoever put that title on it was an editor later the original books are all anonymous written in the third person and moreover and i'm almost done with my rebuttal the followers of jesus were aramaic speaking peasants from galilee lower class lower class men who were not educated in fact peter and john in um Oh, yeah. Peter and um, and John in chapter um, in Acts chapter four verse thirteen are literally said to be illiterate. They couldn't read and write, and of course not. They were fishermen. They did not go to school. The vast majority of people in the ancient world never learned to read, let alone write, and their native language was Aramaic. These books are written in Greek by highly educated rhetorically trained writers who are skilled in Greek composition, not disciples, and don't claim to be disciples. So where did these authors get their stories from? Well, if they were not disciples of Jesus, and they were not, they must have heard the stories circulating from somebody who heard the stories from somebody who heard the stories from somebody. Stories about Jesus, including his resurrection, had been in circulation year after year, century after century, you know? And people told stories that Jesus was killed and got raised from the dead to convert people. So the more the story got complicated, the more they improved the story. And sometimes they even changed and modified the story. Um, these stories are based on oral reports that have been in circulation for decades. And do you know what happened to oral reports in circulation year after year, decade after decade, they get changed. So what evidence do we have that the stories about Jesus' death and resurrection got changed? You can read the stories yourself, simply read Mark's account of Jesus' death, and then read John's account of Jesus' death, and make a list of everything that happens in both, and complete your list. You will find that there are stunning differences in fact there are discrepancies i could give you examples but i think my tongue is up mic check one two mic check one two Uh, can you hear me my friend yes sir i can hear you so uh, now is uh 10 minutes question time yes sir all right let me know when my i'm gonna question you correct so let me know when my time can begin yes yes go ahead go ahead all right uh do you believe tiberius caesar was a historical figure what year w was he a witness of the crucifixion uh, ir irrespective uh, of his witness. Yeah, his reign was from uh, about 14 AD to uh, 37. But I'm just asking if you believe his uh, Tiberius Caesar was just a historical figure. He was a historical figure, yes. But was he, I'm sorry, you should be questioning me and I'm <laughs> not vice versa. Go ahead. No worries, no worries. Um, are you aware that our information about Tiberius comes from sources that were written 80 to 90 years later? Correct. You're aware of that. So if you notice, historians accept the information that we have, even though the only information that we have comes 80 to 90 years later. So do you see how these historians do not require eyewitness testimony in order to find these historical reports uh, reliable insofar as Tiberius is concerned? Well, I disagree. Historians require um, eyewitnesses testimonies to to make their claim solid otherwise there are many historians that lived through, throughout centuries that said things about jesus that were not true so that's why we always go back to was the historian or the person eyewitness okay so you believe tiberius caesar was the historical figure but you believe that the information that we have you recognize comes 80 to 90 years later, correct? 
That's correct. 80 to 90, yeah. and, and you say it yourself, 80 to 90 years later. So there is a huge difference between the first century and 90 years later. There is a huge gap. So there are a lot of things that can be changed during this gap. Right. And my, my point is to show you that the information that we have from these sources that come 80 to 90 years later is all we have to rely on and what we know about uh, Tiberius Caesar, and yet this information is deemed valuable and useful, and almost no scholars uh, dispute the information that we have, tells us accurately what we know about uh, Tiberius Caesar. Um, are you aware that the account of General Hannibal leading an army of elephants across the Swiss Alps was recorded by a Roman historian many decades after the event happened? Correct. Okay. So <clears throat> the historian wasn't an eyewitness to the event. Um, do you, uh, which tafsir, if any, was written by an eyewitness to the crucifixion? What do you mean by tafsir? The Muslim exegetes like um, uh, Ibn Kathir, um, which Muslim exegete in their tafsirs, uh, if any, was an eyewitness to the crucifixion? None. And I agree with you that Islam came almost 700 centuries after the event happened. Okay. Uh, was Muhammad, I know what you're going to say, but <laughs> I still got to ask. No, you. you're fine. You're good. You're good. Was Muhammad an eyewitness to the crucifixion? No, sir. Okay. Now, you do believe that <clears throat> what Muhammad recited ultimately comes from God, but would you agree that it is the same position for Christians? Would you would you agree that Christians believe that what the gospel writers wrote was divinely inspired? What do you mean by divinely inspired? That it ultimately comes from God. Do you believe that this is a Christian belief? This is what Christians believe. Uh, yes, I do believe if that's your question. Yes, I do believe that's what the questions believe that the Bible is uh, uh, inspired. Yes. Okay. Um, now, you had mentioned this and I had brought it up in my opening statement, but a Muslim by the name of um, Paul Williams, um, him and other Muslims uh, like Rumsey, they have mentioned that the phrase it appeared to it appeared to them that he was crucified. So for that reason, we find these reports throughout history, these historians making these references to Jesus crucified. They made that report because this is what appeared to them. And you actually brought that up right now in, in, in your rebuttal. Now, my question to you is how could well by, who is the plural pronoun referring to? It appeared to them. Uh, contextually, who is it referring to? It does refer to the Jews. To the and, Jews, okay. And, and one so, thing, and one thing it, it if you don't mind. It couldn't be referring to. Yeah, and one thing if you don't mind. It appears to them is actually not, that's why I explained the verse from a linguistic perspective. Huh? Mm -hmm. Because the the English language is really, um, it, it doesn't give, it doesn't convey the message. It appeared to them is the best, uh, the best, you know, version you can say it appeared to them. But the, in, the, in Arabic language, it says there is a likeness. It appeared to them that it was Jesus, but it was actually somebody that looks like Jesus. You know what I'm saying? That's right. why you mentioned Dr. Atai and, you know, they, they tried to give these theories. There are um, so many theories. Muslim scholars talked about so many theories because I agree with you that the Quran and the gospel as well, if, if you and I and the, the, the gospel as well are not clear cut on the crucifixion. And this right. is Muslims, uh, Muslims uh, you know, uh, confess to this, the Quran and all the gospels. They're not clear right, so cut on the crucifixion. However, however, we 
we try to bring theories yeah, that actually uh, explains what God Almighty is trying to say. And Ibn Abbas, one of the scholars, one of the disciples of the Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam, actually, and I can share this with you later, this is historically uh, true, he actually, the, the theory that I gave, the second theory that the disciple of Jesus uh, was most likely he's the one that was crucified is actually was found it was a historian here in the u.s that did a research that found out that actually that theory came from iraq from the second century so this is actually before even before islam's advent and uh, you know uh, abdullah ibn abbas actually confirmed this from the prophet muhammad alayhi salatu salam. sorry go ahead okay so in light of the fact that it appeared to them how how did it appear to uh tacitus for example or lucian for example if they weren't at the event if they weren't present there how could it be said that what they write about jesus being crucified is because this is what appeared to them correct i agree with you this is what it appeared to them but right again how could it if they weren't there, how could this have appeared to them? But again, that's what the Quran says. It appeared to them. But in reality, it wasn't Jesus. Right. You know what I'm but, saying? Right. But um, so how could it have appeared to someone such as uh, Tacitus or Lucian if these individuals, these historians, these historical writers, they weren't at the event in order for that event, in order for them to see to see that, how could it be said that this person who looked like Jesus is what they saw if they weren't there? I, I agree with you, historians and anybody that was there that made to appear to them that Jesus was crucified and writing that Jesus crucified, I agree with you. Right. However, uh, well, however, however, we do have, we do have first century disciples after Jesus was raised to heaven. They went to the nations in Jerusalem and around Jerusalem preaching, but they never preached the crucifixion. Matter of fact, there are a couple of, uh, have you heard of Ibunites? Yes. And the Nazarenes. Those are the people that actually witnessed the the whole event and they have never preached the crucifixion so what we're saying from islam's point of view is that it appeared to them that jesus died but they didn't succeed so the jews thought that they killed jesus and they said okay we we, we got uh, it done go ahead excuse me now uh let me just cut you off real quick um so when it says it appeared to them are you saying that this are you saying that tacitus and Josephus and Lucian, these writers are excluded from that statement that no. Now again, we already talked about this statement. historians. Uh, um, go ahead. I'm sorry. Did I cut you off? Yeah Yeah, yeah, so no, I'm just uh, trying to get uh, clarification. I'm still not uh, clear um, So you mentioned the Ebionites, right? So are you saying that it appeared to them is a reference to people like Ebionites and these particular Jews but that does not have any bearing on Tacitus and Lucian and Josephus, later writers who do mention that Jesus was crucified. Well, does, the verse, does the verse pertain to people like Tacitus and Lucian and Josephus, or it doesn't? Well, your question is tricky, and let me, let me explain to you. So after the Jews failed in killing Jesus. They went around telling everybody that we killed Jesus. In another words, in another uh, interpretation of the meaning of the Quran, it says, and they boasted, they boasted, they went around and they told people that we succeeded in killing Jesus. So of course, in the eyes of a lot of people that they have killed Jesus, but in reality, they did not kill Jesus. And the people that were around in the event, 
I mentioned the Ebionites, they actually knew who was crucified. And even among the Jews, the Ikhtalafu means they had a they had they differed among amongst themselves. Some said we crucified him, some said we did uh, Aziz, not crucify did, him. Aziz, did the Ebionites did they know this from um witnessing this or because they heard it? No, no, no. Th these are witnesses. And and I hold on. And I advise you to actually go look into the Ebionites and Nazarenes. These groups, there are many groups, actually first century groups, that actually followed the teachings of Jesus. And they went out and they preached the real teachings of Jesus. They don't believe in the crucifixion. They don't believe in resurrection, let alone, you know, uh, believe that, you know, Jesus died. Okay, so, okay. Go ahead, go ahead, even though your time Move is up, on. but go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. If you have any questions, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm almost done. Yeah, I'm just trying to move on. I'm sorry about that. Oh, um, you're fine. Or let me ask you real quick about um, Josephus. Um, yes. As as Michael Cohen already points out, uh, Josephus was born in Jerusalem and was geographically and chronologically in a position where he would have heard about Jesus from the church at its early inception. So how do you... How do you know Josephus didn't question the original apostles or that he didn't question eyewitnesses who were at the event? Well, again, I can give you an example. Just because some an, an, an event happened that I wasn't a witness, that happened and I heard about it. You, you follow me? Just because an event happened, I was not an eyewitness, right? And I was told about it and people talked about it. I'm writing about it. That doesn't mean that the event is true. That does not make it necessarily true. And this is what I was trying to, 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 to make you understand is that which year did he live in? Was, high, was he an eyewitness or not? Eyewitnesses are, are very important. Like I gave you the, uh, the parable of the, uh, of the court of law. You have to have eyewitness. Otherwise, you will be thrown out if you want to present your case. But without eyewitnesses, unfortunately, throughout this presentation, I gave you that even the Gospels, even Paul himself, none of them are an eyewitness. So therefore, we're left with really nothing from the Christian standpoint. Well, as I mentioned, I don't believe that eyewitness testimony is uh, necessary in order for an account to be considered historically reliable. All right. Um, so give me an example. No, uh, it's okay. Give me an example. Just give me an example of why we don't need uh, eyewitnesses. Well, I think that it's something that is desired, but historians come to the realization that most ancient history is not recorded by eyewitnesses. And so if we demanded eyewitness testimony for every event that happened in antiquity then we would have to throw out most of ancient history Correct. and like i mentioned um right so as i mentioned with um and i have a list right here too of other examples but most simplest the most simplest ones are popular ones like um general hannibal leading the army of elephants across the swiss alps again it was recorded by a roman historian many decades later right and that's the earliest source that we have for it he wasn't an eyewitness Yet almost no historian doubts, doubts that that actually took place. Okay. And so our historical reports are, are flooded with examples where these sources are telling of an event that happened many, many years before and the person recording it was not an eyewitness. And yet historians don't dispute or deny the historicity of these events. So what I understand from what you're saying is that history can prove the resurrection. Is that no i'm talking about the crucifixion correct if history cannot prove the crucifixion how can history prove the resurrection well i would say that there's 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 a vast amount of evidence attesting to the crucifixion and i'm saying that i don't rely or necessitate eyewitness testimony the same way that uh historians don't in the same way that even you as a muslim you don't require eyewitness uh, testimony. But there are things that are mentioned in reports that we still believe and we still deem as historically reliable 
despite the fact that they're not written by eyewitnesses. Well, we agree to disagree. I'm going to move on with my questioning, if you're ready. Okay. Have, you, have you ever heard of the sign of Jonah? That is, yes. that is mentioned in Matthew, I believe, 12, verse 38. Uh, and it's also mentioned in, um, I believe, 12, 39, um, in Luke as well. Matthew 16, yes. Correct. So what do you think the miracle of Jonah was? The miracle of Jonah was the disappearance and reemergence three days later. That was the sign. In fact, Jesus actually... He specifically tells you what aspect of Jonah's story he was alluding to. He says, so will the son of man be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. So he, Jesus qualifies what aspect of the story is the sign. And it's him going down and then reemerging, which is a reference to uh, his resurrection. Okay, so Jonah, you know the story of Jonah, right? Was he alive in the Correct. belly of the whale or was he dead? Uh, scholars dispute that. I think there's uh, good evidence that Jonah was dead. So how come that he came out live from the uh, the belly of the whale? Well, he went down, and then God heard his prayer, and then God revived him to continue with his mission. God exactly. initially called him. Yeah, so, so God initially, when he called or commissioned Jonah, it was to go and to preach to them this message. Initially, he tried fleeing from God, but <laughs> that didn't happen. But okay, basically, so said, God just... So God you said God, God, go, go ahead, ahead, I'm sorry. No, 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 go ahead. No, I'm finished. I'm just reiterating the point. Okay, so you said God heard his prayer. Correct. All right. So why didn't God hear the prayer of Jesus when he prayed? Why did he forsake him? I believe that God did hear his prayer. As you are well aware that... Uh, or in Orthodox Christianity, we do believe that Jesus had two natures. And in light of the fact that Jesus repeatedly foretold and prophesied his upcoming death, for example, in Mark 8, uh, Mark 9, and Mark 10, um, I believe that that specific account or instance, Jesus is speaking in his humanity. And if you read the account in Luke, his, his prayer seems to be answered because it says immediately an angel appeared and he strengthened him. Okay. Now, was Jesus resurrected physically and made spiritual, uh, uh, by meaning immortal, angelic, or just physically like Lazarus? Uh, can you clarify that? So you mean Jesus, physically? You mean, you mean yeah, physically yeah. without? So physically, physically and made spiritual. spiritual. No, I believe that Jesus was uh, resurrected physically, but with a glorified body, as mentioned in First Corinthians fifteen. So, you, are you agreeing then with Jesus in Matthew 28, verse 30, in Mark uh, 12, verse 25, and also in Luke, and like you mentioned, Corinthians 15, that resurrected bodies become spiritualized? Is that, that that's where you're going, right? No, it doesn't say uh, spiritualized. That's a misinterpretation of the Greek word. It talks about receiving new glorified bodies. But as you, as you read the accounts, like for the example, when you read in John or you read in Luke, Jesus actually showed his disciples the wounds in his hands and in his feet and in his side. Uh, in John 20, 25, he says, look, and he showed him the wounds in his hands. Luke okay. makes mention of the wounds in Jesus' so, feet. So it was a physical body. It was a glorified body, but it wasn't spiritual in the sense that it was a so immaterial what saying, ghost life. What you're saying is that he was transformed and made immortal, right? What do you mean transformed and made Im immortal? Because I asked you the question, was he resurrected spiritually and made? Yeah, but can, can you qualify? I, as a Christian, believe Jesus had uh, two natures. So I don't believe he became immortal. But I think there's a deeper meaning that you're you're trying to ask. I know you as a Muslim don't believe that. So no, I'm okay. trying to ask for clarification. So, so, so Jesus, since you believe that Jesus have uh has two natures so jesus Correct. then would have would have been susceptible to hunger thirst fatigue and death right correct 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 yeah so 
Did you know that being transformed and immortalized is the same as being spiritualized? No, I don't think that's the case at all. As a, if you read uh, 1 Corinthians 15, it doesn't say uh, spiritualized. It says new glorified bodies. But for example, when you read uh, Matthew 17, there was an instance in Jesus' earthly ministry in which his, his glory was allowed to be uh, shown to his disciples. And I think that that wasn't a that wasn't necessarily a uh, a change in total material from Jesus. Okay. So I believe that when Jesus was resurrected, as First Corinthians fifteen says, the body that he now has is a physical body, but it's a glorified body. I don't believe that it's referring to something that's pure spiritually or um, anything like that. So what do you mean by glorified? Are you meaning spiritualized? Uh, what do you mean by spiritualized? When you say spiritualized, it, it could denote something like a ghost or a, a phantasm. And I, I don't grant Correct. that. So, Correct. Because yeah, you, alluded, that. you alluded to that in, you know, when Jesus appeared to his disciples right. after the resurrection. Right. And, and then to qu I qualified it by saying Jesus also showed his disciples the wounds he had. In fact, even okay. in Luke, he eats. And in John 2, he, he eats. So... It's not a spiritual body. When you say spiritualized, I think you're uh, connoting that it might be just pure spiritual. That's not the type of body Jesus had. Uh, he did have a new glorified body, but in this body, he still bore the wounds from the cross and he was able to eat food. Okay, so why then would a, an immortally resurrected Jesus, um, A, need to have the stone at the mouth of the sepulcher rolled away, and have his linen sheets and wrapped. B. I don't think B, that, Go ahead. I don't think that was the for the benefit of him. I think it was for the benefit of his followers. Okay. Um, let's move on to the um, to the my last question, and then you can go ahead with your um, uh, last closing statement. If the resurrection is a fact, as you say then why do all four Gospels differ as to who initially witnessed this event? What they saw and what, what they did? I think all four Gospels are reporting different aspects, but none of them are contradictory. They contain variations in wording, they contain uh, additions and or omissions in details, but this is none different than, as I mentioned in my opening statement, than mm -hmm. Surah 780 or compared with Surah 2754, which also retell the same story. And so I mentioned about being consistent. Uh, the, the resurrection narratives simply contain additions and omissions. Uh, for example, um, in John's account, he only mentions Mary, but he doesn't say Mary alone went to the tomb. However, the other gospels do mention Mary with other women. With other women. However, right. when you look at the when you look at the text more in depth, it's clear that even though John 20 verse 1 only mentions Mary going to the tomb and you would say, hey, well, that's a difference. The very next verse, John 20 verse 2, hmm. indicates that others were with her because it says, Mary says, we do not know where they laid him. So the plural pronoun is an indicator that she's not alone. So I think that when we read the Gospels at a surface level reading, we could get the impression oh, well, there are differences, and therefore this compromises the historical reliability of the accounts. But if you read any, um, for example, uh, Haley's big book on Bible contradictions and those, they address these alleged discrepancies, and as you, as, if you read that type of book, or any, any scholarly... Uh, well, I, I don't read those types of books, but I made my own research, and I can share with you the discrepancies and contradictions between all the Gospels when it comes to the, uh, and, and we're not talking about small contradictions, we're talking about serious contradictions when it comes to the crucifixion and the uh, resurrection. Uh, John, for example, contradicts uh, the synoptics by, by maintaining that Jesus bore his own cross, Jesus was impaled on cross, um, and disciples were present at the crucifixion. And also he says that Jesus was anointed on Good Friday. Now, I, I, I'll be happy to share, you know, all this information with you, but we do have serious uh, contradictions uh, when it comes to the, um, the, the Gospels. So, all those that you mentioned um, are easily reconciled 
and I'm sure you know, obviously you know what the definition of a contradiction is. But the one where you mentioned where John reports um, a problem with, did Jesus carry his own cross or was it Simon of Cyrene? Right. But is it not true? Is it not true that the fact that both of these accounts could be easily harmonized, isn't it, isn't it reasonable to believe that Jesus started off bearing his own cross and because he got flogged, he was weak. And at some point on his way to the execution site, they compiled a stranger to help Jesus. I there mean, was nothing problematic with that. We don't believe that Jesus carried his own cross at all or being crucified right. or or died, let alone that somebody else carried the cross for him. Right. But I, I having, you don't believe it. Having, but having, said that, having said that, um, it was a pleasure. You can go ahead uh, with your closing statement. All right, let me know when um, yeah, I'm good you're to good. know, my friend. You're good to go, sir. All right. Well, I'm grateful for this opportunity to uh, discuss such an important topic. Um, the first thing I want to point out is that in this dialogue, it became evident that eyewitness testimony is not something necessary to have in order for an account to be considered as historically uh, reliable. I pointed out in my opening statement that historians don't require this and in my discussion with um in the cross-examination period it was clear that my friend aziz admitted hey the tafsir writers were not eyewitnesses to the crucifixion and muhammad was not an eyewitness to the crucifixion now my friend does believe that he can believe the words that are written but all that shows is that we are in agreement and historians too eyewitness testimony is not necessary now, my friend did bring up the fact that in the court of law, you got to have eyewitness testimony. However, that's anachronistic. As I pointed out, that the standard used by historians is that they would like eyewitness testimony to corroborate an event, but that's not a criterion that they demand. And I give the example of General Hannibal uh, leading an army of elephants over the Swiss Alps. And I pointed out that that account was written by a Roman historian many decades later after the event took place, and yet no one doubts the historicity of that event. Likewise, I mentioned that we know about the life of Tiberius Caesar from sources that come 80 to 90 years later, namely uh, Tacitus and Suetonius. And so this again demonstrates that we don't have to have eyewitness testimony to consider an account historically uh, reliable. Um, <clears throat> The discussion of Josephus and Tacitus, I was hoping to be more beneficial. I did bring it up. We didn't get to, to touch it. However, there was one important thing that I think was exhibited in the cross-examination when I brought up uh, Tacitus. My friend Aziz did mention how the Quran says this is what appeared to them. And therefore, that explains why we find affirmation that Jesus was crucified in writings throughout history but i asked him isn't this something that pertains to those who were at the event particularly these specific jews and he said yes so i asked well how could it be possible that this applies to people like tacitus or lucian or josephus when these men weren't eyewitnesses at the event how could it be that when they mentioned Jesus was crucified, how could it be that that's a result of something that they saw, a false appearance, if they weren't at the event? So I know my friend uh, Aziz um, repeated what the Quran says. However, I don't think that actually addressed the question that I was asking. I didn't also get to ask him about the reliability of uh, Josephus. I did mention that Josephus grew up in Jerusalem. He was born in Jerusalem. He was a contemporary with some of the apostles. And so I did ask, hey, how do we know that Josephus didn't speak to eyewitnesses who were at the event? And so the question still stands. It's possible that Josephus may, has got, may have got his information from eyewitnesses who were at the event. And if so, he's getting his information from primary sources, not Christian hearsay. 
um my friend aziz did mention um a few other things um uh towards the end actually i, I wish he would have brought him up at the um uh rebuttal period but let me see what i can get to um my friend aziz did, did ask the question hey what about um third person we cannot trust some of the gospel writers because they're writing in third person however there are accounts like josephus's account he also writes in the third person he did mention that uh the woman stood afar they stood at a distance and i would say yeah but just because the gospels mention that the woman stood at a distance this doesn't mean that they stood across the town uh they could have been 30 feet to 100 yards away moreover we know from other texts such as genesis 37 17 through 19 that people who were seen far away were still recognizable Josephus's brothers, excuse me, Joseph's brothers recognized that Joseph was coming even though they saw him from afar. Also, John 19 25 reports that Mary and a few others stood near the cross and even spoke to Jesus. So there's no reason to believe that just because the woman stood afar that there was some type of uncertainty. It was also brought up that all the first, all the disciples forsook Jesus. This is a common uh, text brought up, but I think it's misapplied. It's evident from Matthew 26, 36 and Mark 14, 32, that the disciples fled, but they fled from the Garden of Gethsemane, not from Golgotha. Also, this scattering took place the night before the crucifixion, not during the afternoon of it. Furthermore, we are told in other texts, such as John 18, 15, that even though some of the disciples fled after initially fleeing, some of them returned and came back. John 18, 15 says, Simon Peter followed Jesus and so did another disciple. So this text doesn't prove that no one knows what happened to uh, Jesus's crucifixion. And re in regard to the author, what's John authored it? Uh, I can see to the fact that there is scholarly debate as to uh, which John authored this gospel, right? Uh, I, I don't have any, any problem with that. But for the most part, some people like Lydia McGrew and uh, Lauren Zalek have heavily defended the notion that this particular John is John, the son of Zebedee. Other candidates that have been put forth are uh, Lazarus. He's called someone whom Jesus loved. Um, John Mark has been put forth as a candidate. However, none of these are apostles. And John 13 makes it clear that this beloved disciple who authored the fourth gospel was an apostle. So John 13 eliminates Lazarus and John Mark from being candidates. Moreover, Irenaeus uh, confirms or he states that uh, the author of the fourth gospel, this beloved disciple, was John the son of Zebedee. He says it in uh, Against Heresies. So I thank my friend Aziz for the time that we had. I wish it could have been longer. Um, towards the end, Aziz, uh, you brought up some alleged discrepancies. Um, I would love to spend time and speak to you and address those. I do believe that if we're given the time, I can uh, walk you through and show you that each and every one is reconcilable and none of them constitute as an actual true contradiction. And my last point is that, yes, between the four accounts, you mentioned the resurrection narrative right now, there are additions and omissions of details. But I remind you, read Surah 7, and compare that with Surah 27. Read Surah 780 and compare that with Surah 2754. You have a retelling of the same event. And there too, the wording is different. One account omits details. The other account uh, 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 adds stuff, omits stuff. The wording is different. But you and I both know those do not constitute as a, contra as a contradiction. That being said, I'll give all glory to the triune God, name the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And I thank you for this time. All right. Um, you stated John. You mentioned John and Mary standing by the uh, crucifixion feet. I went through all the um, the Gospels and I questioned the validity of John. Who is John? John was written almost a hundred years after the event. In any case. For my closing statement, first, I am grateful. I would like to thank you for being here at Blogging Tawheed. I think that this sort of dialogue is extremely beneficial. And it seems that a lot of times 
when people use the phrase interfaith or debate or whatever dialogue, they sort of misconstrue misconstrue it to mean that it only refer to focusing on our religious similarities or differences, right? So oftentimes it has this connotation that interfaith or debating is focusing on our similarities or differences, but I think an integral part of interfaith work, like what we're doing right now, is understanding our differences. This is a key component of interfaith work. And so I know a lot of people, when they hear this word debate, it sort of uh, conjures up images of animosity, uh, distrust, and hostility between individuals, and even between you know, organizations. But the fact of the matter is, it doesn't really have to be. I think if we understand our differences, it can have the opposite uh, effect on people. Because imagine, what is the alternative? you know, of not having a dialogue like this. People would remain ignorant, right? I mean, granted, we do have differences. We don't deny that. That's something we accept, and I think it's the best we can do. See, um, we have differences in nature and in life in general that we overlook on a daily basis. The difference of the day and the night like the Quran says, the difference in vegetations and fruits, the difference in our tongues, our skin color, and within ourselves. Yet, all of this creates a bouquet of colorful, beautiful flowers that represents humanity. At the end, at Plugin Tawheed, we're determined to create more dialogue like this because if you ask me, there is not enough dialogues or discourses in which we discuss things that are significant to people you know uh, we live in an age in which trivial is emphasized and the significant is relegated to the peripheral we're talking about the fate of jesus this is an issue which affects so many people muslims christians and non-muslims and non-christians alike so i think it's healthy and it's good to talk about these things and understand our differences i enjoyed the conversation and i had the pleasure speaking with you i wish it was too long uh we'll do it all over again i am positive i hope to have you again on the show having said that thank you for watching blogging to hate till next time greetings and peace will be with you wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah greetings everyone أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم وإذ قال الله يا عيسى ابن مريم أأنت قلت للناس اتخذوني وأمي إلهين من دون الله قال سبحانك ما يكون لي أن أقول ما ليس لي بحق إن تعلم ما في نفسي ولا أعلم ما في نفسك إنك أنت علام